more everybody will come back i'm so happy to meet you again in this project uh, really it's important for those who's working in the gulf area and used to see a lot of sickle cell disease uh, how to differentiate between fat embolization and pulmonary embolism this is very important point in management of patient with sickle cell disease let us see this case uh, an 18 year old female patient known case of sickle cell disease chronic calcular cholecystitis was admitted to our icu because of severe shorts of breath tachypnea respiratory rate uh, almost 50 per minute hypoxic auto saturation 88 on 12 liter non breathing mask she was sleepy complaint of generalized body ache heart rate 150 per minute blood pressure 110 over 70 without inopressors uh, heart examination sinus tachycardia chest bilateral basal crackles we sent all the investigation and we start to do the first critical care ultrasound we start by ivc it is on the any dilated side yeah, it's not too much dilated but not collapsing and you can mention that cvb is almost 10 in this patient uh, the four chamber view as you see here this is the left atrium left ventricle right atrium and right ventricle this is the interventricular septum interatrial septum as you see here in this patient which is complaint of acute respiratory failure she has right side dilatation compressing the left side because you will expect the right ventricle to be 60 percent of the volume of the left ventricle but to see the right ventricle more than left ventricle in diameter and in size and also right atrium is more uh, in size than left ventricle that means right side is dilated really uh, this is very important so this patient has dilated right side and acute respiratory failure this is the long axis bar sternal view you see also right ventricle seem dilated and compressing the left ventricle left ventricle is contracting well yeah, almost kissing you see here with m mode you see the ejection fraction is almost 60 percent left ventricle is doing well but compressed by dilated right side and as you see here with inspiration here you see the right side dilatation increase this is the ventricular interdependence because right side is markedly dilated with increased blood flow in uh, during inspiration it can shift the septum towards the left side and increase the size here also you see here here is the systole this is the systole of the uh, septum here and at the end of the systole there is this kinetic movement here the septum will in late systole the septum will go towards the right ventricle because of late dilated dil contraction of the right side so uh, here this is a short axis view as you see markedly dilated uh, right side and compressing uh, the septum and lead to d-shaped uh, left ventricle so a patient has acute respiratory failure hemodynamic instability with dilated ivc and right side dilatation compressing left side because this patient has normal blood pressure but with tachycardia supposed to have a normal blood pressure with normal heart rate but if the heart rate is 150 this is the sign of hemodynamic instability uh, please if you see this scenario because it's uh, too, too it's very common scenario in uh, critical care area in emergency uh, the department and the icu if you see this acute respiratory failure with dilated right ventricle compressing left ventricle uh, you should search for this finding immediately you should answer these questions is it acute or chronic core pulmonary this dilatation of the right ventricle is it acute event or it is chronic event over years because of cobd or pulmonary fibrosis or left side heart failure lead to right side dilatation the best answer to these questions really simply 
look for the function of the right ventricle. Look for the function of the right ventricle because in acute dilatation because of pressure overload of the right ventricle, right ventricle has thin wall, only 0.5 centimeter. So it will dilate and fail. So you will not expect in acute event the right ventricle to compensate and you will see signs of right ventricle failure with very bad TAPC, very clear. Second important questions in this scenario, you need to answer the questions of this. Is it the right ventricle has pressure overload or volume overload or both? And this dilated right ventricle is due to pressure overload or volume overload or both. Let us see. To answer the first questions, simply you need to put the M mode at the uh, tricuspid valve annulus here to look for the TAPSI, tricuspid valve or plane systolic excursion. Here it is 10.7 millimeter, almost one centimeter. Normal, it is 1.7. So our patient has dilated and failed right ventricle. It's going with acute corbal monad. Uh, second, you look especially in these severe cases with marked dilatation on the right side, look for the 60-60 sides. It is not sensitive, but really specific sides. Uh, if the right ventricle uh, is failing and weak, it cannot generate pressure. It cannot contract and generate pressure in the pulmonary artery, so you will not expect the pulmonary artery systolic pressure to exceed 60 millimeter mercury. So when we did, when we put the uh, continuous wave doubler here at the tricuspid valve flow, tricuspid regurg flow, we make it in the maximum flow here and the machine will measure the uh, big systolic uh, pulmonary artery pressure. It is 31 millimeter mercury and if you add 10 millimeter mercury of the dilated inferior vena cava, you are talking about the pulmonary artery systolic pressure of 60, of 40 uh, millimeter mercury, so it is less than 60. But in case of chronic corbal monal with long standing process and uh, sick, bulky right ventricle, it can generate pressure and the pulmonary artery systolic pressure can reach more than 60 millimeter mercury. So, this is also signs of right ventricular failure. What else I can look for? In the parasternal short axis view at the level of great vessels, I will put the pulsed wave doubler here at the pulmonary artery, flow pulmonary valve to, uh, uh, to measure and to analyze the pulmonary artery flow. The flow will come away from me here. The probe is here, will come away from me, will be here below the baseline. I will look for two things of this pulmonary artery flow tracing. I will look for the peak velocity, the time to peak velocity, acceleration time, pulmonary artery flow acceleration time, the time from beginning of the systolic flow to the peak flow, and if this time is less than 60, it's going with acute corbal monal and acute cor and this is the 66 side. The first 60 is the pulmonary artery pressure less than 60, and the second 60 is the pulmonary valve uh, flow acceleration time is less than 60 milliseconds. Also, try to train your eye to look for this important science. This notched flow of the pulmonary valve flow. This notched flow, you see, this is the first peak, and after that, the flow decreases and decreases, and this is another peak. And this is also a sign of acute core pulmonal, and this is because the right ventricle is weak, so it will start contraction, and because of resistance from pressure overload, the contraction will tease and the flow will tease, cease here will decrease and after that we'll get the second peak. So this notched flow is a sign of weak right ventricle also and signs of pressure overload. 
بريشر ان فرونت اوف ذا رايت فيل رايت سايد اند فيلنج رايت فينتريكل سو ويز ذيس دوبلر ستادي اكروس ذا كارديياك فالف you can get an idea about what is going on the pathogenesis of the shock of our patient first putting the continuous wave doppler here in the tricuspid valve with low pulmonary arterial pressure means right ventricular weakness and failure and after that this rapid acceleration and denoting denoting uh, right side weakness and obstruction in front of the right side and this obstruction can be confirmed by looking to the flow in the left side because if there, if there is obstruction in front of the right ventricle that means the feeling of left ventricle will be impaired and this is here you see very little flow in the mitral valve by putting the pulse wave doppler heel at the tip of mitral valve it's going with grade one that's its function and if you have a little flow and small flow in the mitral valve probably you will have a small and uh, diminished flow in the left ventricular outflow tract and the decreased stroke volume as you see here if you put the pulse wave doppler here at the lvot uh, left ventricular outflow tract to uh, measure the lvot vti which is the surrogate of stroke volume it will be low it's here 13 and the normal from 18 to 22 so by this Doppler mapping of the right and left side, you can get the feeling of obstructive shock in our patient. So the first questions I can answer, which is, it is acute process. It is acute process. And second questions is, is there a right ventricular pressure overload or volume overload or both? This uh, right ventricle enlargement and ballooning compressing the septum and lead to D-shaped left ventricle. You need to look for this D-shaped left ventricle in both. If you see the D-shaped in systole, that means there is right ventricular pressure overload. And if you see also in diastole, that means there is volume overload. In our patient, really, the D-shape of the left ventricle is maintained in both the systole and the diastole. That means our patient has pressure and the volume overload. And this is very important in management because presence of volume overload, you should think about decrease IV fluids and to try to make the patient with the negative balance to decrease the uh, dilatation of the right side and the compression of the left side to increase the flow. Okay, it is acute corbal monal with pressure and volume overload. What's causing this acute corbal monal? In patients with sickle cell disease uh, with, who complain of a severe painful crisis and after that develop a short of breath, it could be systemic fat mobilization syndrome with acute chest syndrome and it could be pulmonary embolism because this patient uh, are liable for pulmonary embolism and because of pain uh, and cannot move the lower limb for a long time can develop DVT and complicated by pulmonary embolism. How can I differentiate between both? First, uh, always think of fat embolization syndrome as a systemic disease. So look at manifestation of fat embolization on other organs. In our patient, there was a painful crisis, there was increased serum creatine bilirubin, there was thrombocytopenia and the dropping of homoglobin. But pulmonary embolism may affect only at the beginning the uh, respiratory side and the cardiovascular side. Second, fat embolization will lead to pulmonary inflammation. So you will expect to see a lot of P-line and subpleural consolidation. In contrast to pulmonary embolism, which lead to pulmonary oligemia mostly a line so in our patient really there is a lot of p line and you see here subpleural consolidation and really it is wet lung wet lung is going with inflammation which is going with fat embolization third 
You can expect a DVT in pulmonary embolism, but not in fat embolization. Here, our patient has compressible uh, right, uh, right femoral vein, common femoral vein, and left common femoral vein, and also popliteal was compressible. No signs of DVT in our patient. Fourth, CT pulmonary angio. Really, CT pulmonary angio, if the patient is stable, she can go to the CT pulmonary angio. Uh, and in case of pulmonary embolism, uh, acute pulmonary embolism lead to dilatation of the right side, which reach in size more than left side, you will expect uh, a heavy burden of thrombus in the pulmonary circulation. You can expect uh, main branches affected. But in case of fat embolization, it is small uh, emboli and scattered all over the pulmonary muscular bed in the subsegmental and segmental region and lead to pressure overload by widespread obstruction, not by localized obstruction. And in our patient, really, the main branches uh, was okay, uh, were okay, but there is, you see here, uh, subsegmental and the periphery uh, leucency here is going with a small emboli which is going with fat embolization. And also you see the lung, it is inflamed the lung with a lot of uh, infiltrate and air space obesity uh, going with inflammation of fat embolization more than the pulmonary emboli. Because pulmonary emboli to cause infarction, it will happen in, uh, almost 24 hours later and it will be localized to small area, not widespread all over the lung. It's very important because this will affect the management. You need to diagnose uh, perfect because you will manage in proper way. In our patient, uh, the presence of acute core pulmonary right ventricular volume and the pressure overload with compression of left ventricle is a big contraindication of the IV fluids. You, if you see the right ventricle is weak, is weak, cannot contract well with low tapsy and compressing the left ventricle, take care of the IV fluids because both the balance will make the right ventricle more dilated, more weak, more compression on the left side, and more shock. So in this case, we keep our patient on a negative balance with a small dose of IV Lasix. Uh, we give antibiotics because of airspace obesities for community acquired pneumonia. We cannot neglect infection as a precipitating of this fat embolization. We give five cycles of blood exchange. We keep the patient on alternate high flow nasal cannula with night by BAP. Really, if the patient is conscious and tolerating and the uh, respiratory rate decrease with high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive, better to avoid in acute hemodynamic instability, better to avoid the invasive mechanical ventilation because giving sedation and giving too much positive pressure can uh, disturb the circulation and can make hemodynamic instability in this acute event. So as long as the patient uh, is uh, tolerating and the spot rate improved with non-invasive, try non-invasive. Uh, and in my lecture about pulmonary plasma, I talk a lot about these uh, scenarios. Four days later, really patient go in right way. Patient go in the right way. You see here this dilated crying right ventricle now went back to normal size and with very good shape uh, for a chamber view. You see compare between this right ventricle and this right ventricle. Here, long axis parasternal view, dilated com right side, compressing left side. Now left side is okay with very good contraction of left side and not dilated right side. You see short axis view, there is pressure and volume overload with D-shaped left ventricle. Here, uh, resume the normal beauty, uh, circular appearance of the left ventricle. No more D-shaped uh, in on systole or on uh, diastole. Even when we put the pulsed wave doppler here at the flow of the pulmonary valve, we found at the beginning this notched flow which denotes very weak right side and the pressure in front of it. So it, uh, it decreased in the flow at the middle of systole and again the flow again and with very rapid uh, stroke here no more notched flow because now the right ventricle is doing well and the obstruction in front of right ventricle decreased by management of fat embolization and the TAPSI also started to improve here compared to the beginning. 
at the, this is the end product of our management. This is the stroke volume or the surrogate, which is the LVOT VTI. It will start by 13, now end up by 18.5. So no more shock. Uh, stroke volume again became normal. Thank you for watching. Uh, and this is very important really for the doctors who are dealing with sickle cell disease and uh, syncofat mobilization. Uh, see you in another project. Bye-bye.